Hello, and welcome everyone to NCSL's webinar on State Newborn Screenings Programs, Policy, Options, and Opportunities. My name is Margaret Weil, and I am a Policy Specialist with the National Conference of State Legislatures, and I will be moderating the webinar today. Today's webinar is a platform for information exchange and engagement. Over the next 60 minutes, we encourage participation through our chat box, so feel free to type your questions into the chat box, which is in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. I want to briefly mention some resources with this webinar platform. Above the presentation, you will see a couple of tabs with one of them labeled resources. Here you can find and download a PDF version of the PowerPoint as well as some other handouts from the speakers. Another tab is labeled speakers where you can read the bios of the speakers. You can access these tabs anytime during the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on NCSL's website within the week. So for those of you who don't know, NCSL, or the National Conference of State Legislatures, is the bipartisan organization that serves the legislators and legislative staff from the states, commonwealths, and territories. NCSL provides research, technical assistance, and opportunities for policymakers to exchange ideas on the most pressing state issues and is an effective and respected advocate for the interests of the states in the American federal system. The conference operates from offices in Denver, Colorado, where I am located, and Washington, D.C. NCSL does not advocate for specific policies, nor do we take a position on any state issues. This webinar is a platform for information exchange. So on your screen now, you will see the agenda for today's webinar. I will briefly provide an overview of the webinar and highlight some of the resources. We will first hear from Dr. Carla Cuthbert. Dr. Cuthbert will provide a national perspective on some of the successes and challenges from states, as well as some future anticipated challenges states might face. Next, we will hear from Nisha uh, Kuspa, who will share information on financial considerations for states as they look to include new conditions as a part of their newborn screening programs. Finally, we will hear from two state legislators about policy options and innovations in their states related to newborn screening programs. First, we will hear from Assemblywoman Salages from New York and then from Representative Balweg from Wisconsin. There will be time for Q&A at the conclusion of the presentations and participants can ask questions at any time during the webinar. Please enter your questions into the chat box in the bottom right-hand side of your screen and specify which speaker you are addressing your question to. I will read the question and then ask the speaker to address them. Here are some of the NCSL resources um, we just wanted to highlight on this topic, including a ledger's brief that we wrote on state newborn health screening policies. I also wanted to flag that we are having a maternal and child health legislative tracking database that will be going live in 2019, so stay tuned for that. This database will feature enacted legislation from the states across the country on a variety of maternal and child health topics, including newborn screenings. We would like to thank our funders who make this work on maternal and child health topics possible, including the Maternal and Child Health Bureau within the U.S. Department of Health Resources and Services Administration, as well as Novartis, who made, supported this webinar today. And with that overview, I would like to introduce our next presenter. I will be giving shorter bios for our speakers during this webinar in the interest of time, but again, if you all are interested in more information on our speakers, please click on the Speakers tab. It is my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Carla Cuthbert. Dr. Cuthbert is the Chief of the Newborn Screening and Molecular Biology Branch in the Division of Laboratory Sciences, National Center for Environment Health within the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I'll now hand it over to you, Dr. Cuthbert. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I can think of nothing better to be able to, than to be able to talk about uh, about newborn screening and about um, and about your states and their participation and so on. We work very closely with them, and so I hope that this talk would be very informative to you. So as I begin, I would like to introduce you to Carissa Olson, a mom I met from Minnesota. In 2008, she gave birth to her second son, Everett. Uh, and just prior to his birth, an acquaintance can encourage her not to participate in newborn screening. Fortunately for Carissa, there was a very attentive nurse who approached her three times and finally managed to convince her to actually have Everett screened. 
As it happened, Everett had galactosemia. Galactosemia is a terrible disease. It's associated with the inability to break down milk sugar called galactose. And as galactose levels increase, it produces toxins which result in the symptoms that we see, such as learning disabilities, cataracts, and causes damage to the liver, kidney, and, and to the brain. Untreated, newborns with, um, uh, with galactosemia generally die. So Everett's life was spared, and Carissa subsequently became an incredibly strong advocate for newborn screening since she knew firsthand what the benefits were. A newborn screening is not, does not discriminate. Everett could have been born to any one of us. So what is the goal of newborn screening? And you may come across several definitions, but what I really want you to remember and to go home with is that newborn screening is meant to prevent harms to newborns who are affected with specific diseases. How does newborn screening achieve this? Generally through early detection of these newborns who are at risk for these diseases. And once we identify them, we can then provide appropriate medical intervention resulting in health benefits for that particular newborn. Newborn screening is distinct from diagnostic testing that you would receive in a hospital environment when you're not feeling well. It is essentially a population-based risk assessment. So if you consider this field of red poppies, you want to be able to find that single white poppy. And that single white poppy represents that newborn who is at risk. So newborn screening uh, in newborn screening, the population that we screen is just is largely normal. And like this picture, the aim of newborn screening is to identify the very few affected newborns in the midst of a very large normal population. Newborn screening has been around for a long time. Uh, if you are under 50, and I don't want to know, um, you have likely been screened for a specific panel of conditions uh, based on the state that you are in. And this is also true for your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews. Newborn screening began in four states in 1963 with a disorder called phenylketonuria. It's phenylketonuria, or PKU, as many people call it. It's a defect uh, in your body's ability to break down an amino acid called phenylalanine. And as with galactosemia, toxic compounds accumulate and result in the symptoms that we see, such as intellectual disability, brain damage, seizures, motor, pro motor problems, and such like. And before newborn screening, phenylketonuria was actually the leading cause of intellectual disability in the, new, in, in the United States. Now all states screen for PKU. Today, all states have newborn screening programs and screen for many, many disorders beyond PKU. They use many more sophisticated tests and look at complex biomarker profiles to make the decisions about whether or not these newborns have disease. What do you need to know about newborn screening? Well, you need to understand, if you don't already realize, that newborn screening programs are state-based um, public health programs. And as states, you have the full autonomy and oversight of your own programs. That being said, newborn screeners are incredibly collaborative. They share information. They help each other across state borders. They work together to address issues that impact them all. As a uh, member of a federal agency, um, we provide guidance and support at our branch at the CDC. Uh, our primary purpose is to provide technical support and quality assurance and testing for all of your state programs. Newborn screening programs are also opt-out programs, which is wonderful because it means that every newborn, regardless of where they're born within your state, has universal access to this program and receives the associated benefit. Since it's a state program, Variations do exist across borders, and variations will exist in terms of you know, what disorders are screened for in each state, how many disorders are added, uh, how disorders are added to the state's newborn screening panel, and uh, whether or not you have an advisory committee that makes these decisions, which method or which assay is used to screen for these disorders. Usually this is often decided by a newborn screening laboratory director, and they have the say in terms of what gets done there. Also, whether or not parents can refuse screening or exercise other parental options. So if you would like to have additional information on the disorders on your state screening panel, and you'd like to have some information about options available to parents, 
uh, in your state, feel free to go directly to your state health department's website. Um, and in addition to the state's department's website, additional resources uh, are included in websites run by New Steps and by Babies First Test, and the website location is indicated here. Now, as a laboratory scientist, I have a little bit of a bias with respect to laboratory testing, and I think it's very important. However, I do want to stress that newborn screening is so much more than just a test. It is a system. Um, it begins at the bottom left of, of this slide um, with ensuring that both the provider and the parents have adequate education about what to expect with newborn screening. Once the newborn, once the infant is born, specimens are collected and transported to the newborn screening laboratory. Once samples are received, specimens are punched, tested, results are verified. The results are then sent to both the physician and the parent to ensure that the child receives the appropriate follow-up or diagnostic testing. And if the child is found to have a disease, appropriate medical intervention is initiated to limit or prevent the negative outcomes of the disease. Long-term care uh, and, and management is needed because these conditions are inherited or they are with the child for life, and so this really requires long-term medical care. Now again, this process is not static, so you see the red arrows in the center, and they depict that programs really need to engage in continuous evaluation to make improvements within their program over time. So newborn screening is more than a lab test, and this slide is really meant to show you that newborn screening is um, the test itself is part of a very large support infrastructure that is needed to ensure that, that the overall program is successful. At the center of it all is the baby and the family. And uh, this, Im this, this image really is meant to demonstrate uh, that newborn screening involves um, an, an integrated system of many stakeholders. It includes the health department. It includes the clinicians who will provide ongoing medical care, family support services, the laboratory technical support to maintain quality and testing, policy, ethics, advocacy, because when you are talking about newborns, everyone feels the need to be able to protect and offer the best chance at life to this vulnerable population. What diseases are associated with newborn screening? Well, most of the diseases are um, are identified through dread blood spot testing, and this covers more than 50 core and secondary newborn screening disorders. And uh, these samples are, as I indicated, collected uh, and sent to birthing facilities. But the other two tests uh, that are done are done at, as point-of-care tests or at the bedside. This includes the hearing test, which screens for congenital hearing loss in the range where speech is heard, or pulse oximetry, um, where there are screens for critical congenital heart disease that look for the presence of hypoxemia. On this slide, I've, in, I've listed 33 of the 35 core uh, newborn screening conditions that are detected through dried blood spot tests, and this is really to highlight the importance of dried blood spot testing in this entire process. This slide just uh, indicates that new conditions continue to be added onto newborn screening panels, and uh, this slide really describes um, the incidence of the uh, different types of disorders or how frequently you might expect to see a new case show up in your respective states or across the country. And just I want to note here that in the last 10 years, five conditions have been added to the newborn screening panel or RUSP or the recommended uniform screening panel. And most of your states are likely at some point in the process of, of implement, implementing these conditions. So what is the RUSP exactly, the Recommended Uniform Screening Panel. It's a list of disorders that have been recommended by the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services for states to screen as part of their screening program. The intent really is to assure a level of uniformity across states. It is a recommendation, not a requirement. It is not mandated for you to do so. So you, again, have the autonomy to decide what states get onto your state panels. Um, and uh, and these are just recommendations at a higher, uh, more federal level. 
disorders uh, are added to the RUSP based on uh, evidence, uh, whether or not early detection or medical intervention provides benefit or net benefit to the newborn. Uh, it's based on the public health readiness to screen and the availability, the availability of effective treatment. So I just wanted to stress that there is definitely an established process for adding new conditions to the RUSP. So what about the current challenges that are faced by state newborn screening programs? Well, uh, issues that will impact all of your programs and all of the states it was, it includes a number of, of different issues just based on the nature of newborn screening itself. There's always a sense of urgency. These conditions are time critical. Turnaround times for testing is very important. Testing and then reaching out, getting the, getting the newborns and so on, this entire process, uh, it has a sense of urgency as associated with it. Programs are responsible for testing all of the newborns. You don't want to miss any newborn. Many providers need to work together with the newborn screening programs and with other stakeholders to ensure that the system is robust. Out-of-range uh, results represent newborns who are at risk for diseases and need to be followed up. So locating the, the newborns could present uh, difficulties, getting that child into short-term follow-up so that they could be properly diagnosed, and then getting them into long-term care and, and, and surveillance all present challenges. Um, there are also challenges with respect to budgets and restrictions. Programs are often asked to do more with less, and there are often challenges with staff retention. Uh, there are legal and legal issues in areas of, of public concern, such as informed consent for retention and use of residual dried blood spots, privacy and confidentiality protections, public concerns and about genetic testing. As a result, we really do need to be more proactive about educating the public about newborn screening. And of course, there's, there are issues associated with the availability of direct-to-consumer tests for newborn screening. Babies do not take a break whenever there are disasters or adverse events. So during these um, uh, uh, these uh, moments, uh, newborn screening programs really need to be prepared and remain in a state of readiness uh, during these scenarios. So states need to have some sort of cont continuity of operation planning to ensure that they are ready uh, for these adverse events. Newborn screening Laboratories have very high throughput testing with very large menus. Uh, you can see the comparisons here of five states. Uh, you can see the daily number of tests performed, uh, the number of newborns with uh, confirmed diseases annually, and the number of newborns uh, with tests performed that year. Texas alone uh, uh, tends to run about 70,000 tests a day. So with high volume testing for all states, uh, you require a highly skilled workforce to ensure robust testing, staff recruitment, retention. They, these can be issues. Testing platforms are getting more complex, requiring staff to be more to have more advanced skill sets, and IT systems are often in need of improvement. Over the last couple of decades, testing complexity has changed and has in increased, and it is really important for them to keep up with technological advances. And so I have a few pictures of uh, states who have visited the CDC, and we work with them very closely um, to train lab staff on new technologies and ensure consistency across programs. In addition, Adding new conditions to the newborn screening test panel can present challenges. Successful implementation does take time. Newborn screening is a system. Um, many components need to be integrated appropriately to ensure that the program works well. Um, adding a single test can increase the level of complexity, sometimes even several fold. Procurement of reagents and supplies can be long and tedious in some, pro in some instances, and unfunded additions of new disorders can be a challenge. And there, there are also uh, some concerns with being able to have access to providers and treatment. So what does the future look like for newborn screening? Well, none of us have a crystal ball, but here's what we do know. We do know that there are going to be many more conditions that will be added to the recommended uniform screening panel. State programs will need to figure out a way uh, to um, uh, increase their program capacity to cope. 
Um, more diseases means that we need more sophisticated testing platforms uh, to be able to identify disease biomarkers. Tandem mass spectrometry is one of the, the instruments that we use. Um, it's a very important testing platform that allows us to measure many different biomarkers in a single test. Um, but if in the case, as we have here for Texas, that we add a new disease and we're unable to include those biomarkers on an existing test, a state like Texas will have to add 10 new mass spectrometers every single time um, we, we have to add a new condition. And this is not really sustainable. So we need to think uh, about ways to actually do this in a smarter way. We need to come up with better and more sophisticated solutions uh, so that we can increase the number of biomarkers in single platforms. Now, biomarkers are not the only uh, markers that we use to help us identify disease. We also use genetic markers or DNA markers. And um, uh, these molecular markers also help us to identify those who are at risk for disease. And in the left panel, I've listed a number of disorders for which a molecular test is helpful. And these could be either a primary screen or a secondary or tertiary screen. And we're moving towards adopting more and more enhanced testing platforms like this. So what are we doing to help state programs uh, uh, prepare for the future? So at CDC, we are looking to help state programs build capacity and support implementation of new and anticipated conditions on the RUSP. We are looking to provide technical assistance to help them troubleshoot with current tests, and we are assisting them in the development and, impl and the implementation of improved screening methods. In addition, we are in response specifically to the changing needs um, and the evolving needs of the newborn screening community. We are expanding our own performance evaluation programs to support them. Uh, we're improving our quality assurance material offerings, and we are also looking to help states improve the positive predictive value of, of laboratory tests while reducing the number of false positives, and we're doing it in a, in a number of different ways highlighted here. So as we look to the future, CDC, our colleagues at APHL, and state programs, we are taking a, a good look at where we are and where we need to be in the next 10 years. And we've encapsulated that uh, in terms of this newborn screening vision 2030. And really what we want to be able to do is to take a, um, we have a lot of systems that are decades old, and we need to figure out how we can best modernize and bring our testing process and, our, and our, all of our systems into the 21st century. So in our vision, we want to create 21st century solutions to improve disease detection and data-driven decision-making in the newborn screening community. One of the things I like best about this idea is that uh, we can't predict the future, but the best way to predict the future is specifically to create it. So I just have a few take-home messages as I wrap up. Um, newborn screening seeks to prevent harms to newborns affected with severe diseases through early identification and timely medical intervention. Newborn screening is a system and not a test. New conditions are added to the recommended uniform screening panel through an evidence-based process. State newborn screening programs face very specific challenges. And continued expansion of conditions on the RUSP will require more sophisticated test platforms and an improved system for test interpretation. I encourage you to go invite yourself over to your state newborn screening programs. They would love to have an opportunity to visit with you. Ask them for a tour and tell them that Carla sent you. And I would like to thank a number of people for help and discussion on this uh, presentation. And that's all I've got. That's all I've got to say. Thank you so much for listening. And I would like to turn this over to you, Margaret. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Cuthbert. Uh, our next speaker is Nisha uh, Kasaba. Nisha is an associate specialist with the public, in public policy at the Association of Public Health Laboratories. I will now turn it over to you, Nisha. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nisha Kasaba, an associate specialist in public policy at the Association of Public Health Laboratories. Um, APHL represents state and local governmental health laboratories across the United States. Public health laboratories monitor and detect health threats, ranging from foodborne outbreaks, rabies, seasonal flu, to genetic disorders in newborns. Since my time at the association, I've worked closely with our membership to collate data to better understand 
the funding of newborn screening programs nationwide. Like any state-run program, there's a variance in services, costs, financing method, and screening panels as well. So there are three screens that compose a newborn screening program, as Dr. Cuthbert um, spoke about, so blood spot, hearing, and heart. All these screens share a goal of ensuring newborns are tested for potentially life-threatening conditions. However, today, um, I will focus on blood spot testing, where a newborn's heel stick blood is sent to the lab to be screened for a variety of conditions. The responsibility of newborn screening is housed in state public health laboratories by statute or regulation. Public health labs are best positioned to easily monitor high volumes of testing, reduce cost of testing, and most importantly, be a central reference point for immediate and direct follow-up for positive results. Since samples are collected mostly from the private sector, hospitals, and birthing centers, there are inherent nuances in financing this program, making it fairly unique compared to other public health programs. So newborn screening programs are funded by either one or a combination of sources, a newborn screening fee, general funds, Title V grant funding, or insurance reimbursement. In the 80s, only 12 states had newborn screening fees. However, over the past decade, programs are becoming more self-supported, more self therefore increasing the dependency on the newborn screening fee as their primary source of funding. The newborn screening fee is intended to support not just the laboratory screening, but also diagnosis, education, follow-up, and case management. When newborn screening began in the 60s, many conditions of the time were treated with a dietary formulae modifications. They were low-cost, minimal complexity treatment plans. But now more complex disorders are being added to state newborn screening panels, like Dr. Cuthbert referred to, with treatment plans that require years of a coordinated case management team. It is becoming increasingly imperative for newborn screening programs to have a financial model that is able to be nimble and expand its services. So the newborn screening fee across the nation varies from about zero, is from zero dollars, meaning no fee, to upwards of $163. An increase in newborn screening fee is usually coupled with an addition of a disorder to state newborn screening panel. When the state, the, from the state data we have here at APHL, 15 states in the past five years increased their fee on average by $20. The wide range of the newborn screening fee can be, can be attributed to a number of factors. So one, um, a state's annual birth rate contributes to the volume of samples tested by the lab, the number of personnel needed, logistical coordination needed to keep the system running to meet the need of the given population. Two, there are 12 states that screen twice, regardless of the first screen's results. Testing twice is understood to reduce the chance of missing cases of clinically significant disorders. So in these 12 states, naturally the volume of specimens collected is double their birth rate since each baby is pricked twice. The total percent of the U.S. population with a routine second screen is approximately 23%. The number of disorders tested on state newborn screen panel ranges from 30 disorders to upwards to even 60. And fourth, screen lab capacity and capabilities also vary among states. Most states have an in-state laboratory, but most states with less than 40,000 births send their samples to a regional laboratory or contract with a commercial laboratory. It should be known that none of the factors have a linear relationship to the newborn screening fee, but the collation of these factors feeds into, a reason, into why a state's newborn screening fee is what it is. Though all states have each component of the newborn screening program, how robust or resource each component varies state to state, contributing to the variation in the newborn screening fee nationwide. Regardless of the funding source, the methodology of collecting funds varies. Most states charge hospitals for specimen cards, and the hospital or birthing facility is reimbursed through the bundled payment for labor and delivery services. However, there's a small fraction of states that bill insurance companies and Medicaid on their own, sometimes using CPT codes. Nearly 50% of newborns are Medicaid eligible, yet there are no guidance for Medicaid reimbursement. This lack of harmonization of procedural testing codes contribute to the reimbursement discrepancies. After the fee is collected, it is held in various types of funds, 
Most states have a newborn screening specific fund. However, a number of states have their fees placed in other holding locations that are indicated in the red states in the map. Either the, buck, either the newborn screening fee goes into general funds, state lab fund, a public health service fund, or general cash fund. The newborn screening fee is not always used solely for newborn screening activities and instead can be utilized for other state programs. I would, like to, I would like to note that there are three states along with DC who do not have a fee and each of those programs are funded quite differently from one another. So when thinking about adding disorder to your newborn screen panel, do keep in mind the components that bring a newborn screen program to life. For a comprehensive, integrated, and robust newborn screen program, all aspects of the program need to be well supported and funded. Um, and I, I've listed the components, so follow-up, diagnosis, implementation, treatment, program evaluation. Also, always consider the laboratory needs, the cost of the instrumentation, as Dr. Cuthbert was referring to, the infrastructure, staffing, administrative capacity. If you want to learn more about your state newborn screening program, visit the New Steps website where our state-level data is housed. And I appreciate NCSL for giving me the time to provide a quick overview on the financing of newborn screening programs at the state level. If you're interested in visiting your state public health lab, please contact me or APHL, and we would be delighted to put you in contact with, your, with our member lab. Now I'll turn it back to Margaret from NCSL. Thank you. Uh, we will now hear from our two state legislators. First, we will hear from Assemblywoman Salages, who represents the 22nd Assembly District for the New York State Assembly. Assemblywoman Salages chairs the task force on New Americans and is a member of the Committee on Health, the Committee on Social Services, and several other related committees. Assemblywoman Salage, I now turn it over to you. Uh, greetings, everyone. I uh, hope everyone is doing well. Uh, I'd first like to thank the team at NCSL for hosting this important webinar on state and newborn screenings. Um, over the course of a year of this year, I was a member of the prenatal to three advisory group, uh, which allowed me really to deep dive into policy areas of infants and toddlers. And, um, you know, with our, my colleagues, our cohort, we were able to build a framework for state legislators like yourself. Uh, so we hope that you can obtain a copy of our soon-to-be-released report, just to plug our little prenatal of the three group. So one of the topics that we discussed in depth was state newborn screenings. Uh, so um, just a little... A uh, tidbit about myself. I actually, um, on Labor Day, delivered a beautiful baby girl, Rose. And as we cradled Rose, the nurse provided my husband and I with a brochure and a card that outlined the state's newborn screening program, a service of the New York State Department of Health. Um, New York State's newborn screening program is housed in the Woodworth Center in Albany. New York strives to, uh, to, excuse me, New York strives for early identification of children at increased risk for selected genetic and other disorders. And depending on how you slice it, we uh, test for about uh, 50 disorders, uh, 50 to 60 disorders. Um, just recently, um, in October of 2018, we um, actually started testing for three new conditions. There's my baby Rose, as you see on the corner. Um, you know, the scientists at our center screen approximately 250,000 infants every year for rare diseases that would otherwise go undetected at birth. As a result, we have the opportunity to identify and treat infants with these diseases and help them lead healthy and productive lives. Similar to other states, there are about three parts of the screening process uh, with the heel prick. And when the, the small blood sample is taken, it's sent via UPS to our laboratory in Albany for testing. On a side note, our program also collaborates with midwives. Uh, just to give you some historical highlights, the newborn screening program was established by public health law in 1965. In 1996, a law was established to test all newborns for HIV exposure if the parents provided consent. With that, we built the algorithm to identify the HIV, HIV in infants. In 1997, testing was made mandatory for all newborns in New York State. There is no charge for the service provided by the New York State Newborn Screening Program. 
Some doctor's office and hospitals charge a fee to collect the blood sample, but health insurance or other programs often cover all or part of the fee. Babies will receive a newborn screening regardless of health insurance status. Uh, thank you to the team um, at the center because they provided me uh, with much information for our talk today. Uh, they said that they uh, they screen about a thousand samples a day, and like the post office, they work in rain, sleet, or snow. And in Albany, there's a lot of snow. They're really dedicated with what, to what they do. We also established in New York State a follow-up group. If the newborn screening program determines that the results of a screening test is abnormal which is about one in 300 samples, they will contact both the baby's health care provider and an appropriate specialized care center. With the specialist ready and able to help treat these infants, the primary care specialist and the, and the specialist and the, excuse me, and the, the primary care provider will discuss the case and make a plan for further testing and treatment and then contact the baby's parents to make arrangements. Parents are not required to take the babies um, to the specialist referred to them, uh, but we make sure that they receive um, care and help. The newborn screening program is research-based and data-driven with scientists in leadership positions, and they have very advanced degrees. They sit on many natural, national boards and attend many conferences. In addition, they host other states. We are really the go-to state for this initiative. Just as recent as October 2008, spinal muscular atrophy, which is SMA for short, was among the disorders officially included. At the time of the evidence-based review, New York was one of the states that initiated the pilot program, and the whole population was mandated to be screened for it. And so they used our information to build a nationwide algorithm. We are also part of a state Consortium, sorry, <laughs> that's a mouthful. The New York State um, Mid Atlantic Consortium for Genetic and Newborn Screening Services. This group ensures that individuals uh, with disorders and their families have access to quality care and appropriate genetic expertise and information in the region. Uh, several states are involved in this, which include Delaware, uh, District of Columbia. Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia. Uh, our center is really the lead institution for this project. The New York State program is continually improving their screening, screening algorithms to research and with information from follow-up group. To simply put it, one aspect of the follow-up group is to make sure that they confirm the results and seek to reduce false positives. The lab is also supported uh, by by other states and works with other states. For example, after Hurricane Katrina, we contracted with Louisiana to help facilitate their screenings. In addition, when other states' newborn screening recommendations are established by law or regulation, our lab can help facilitate testing until the in-state labs are ready uh, to uh, begin their work. And so some challenges for, in for other states is uh, obtaining technology supplies, so we can help with that. A similar agreement was made with Minnesota to help facilitate um, their uh, newborn screenings. With emerging disorders and conditions being discovered all the time, New York State looks to, to be in the forefront of newborn screenings, and we want to make sure that we can uh, use and help other states. So early uh, diagnosis, intervention, and treatment for these rare diseases have a dramatic positive effect on their child's life, as well as the quality of life of the entire family and caregivers. The cost to the public is much less when children with um, metabolic and genetic diseases are diagnosed early. And so the return on investment is just there. And so I thank everyone for um, their attention and, and thank you uh, for participating in this webinar. And I hand it back to Margaret. Great. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Uh, we will now hear from Representative Balweg, who is the state representative for the 41st Assembly District located in South Central Wisconsin. Representative Balweg is the co-chair of the Joint Committee on Review of Administrative Rules and vice chair for the Committee on Regulatory Licensing Reform. She also sits on the Mental Health and Children and Families Committees, among others. Representative Balweg, the floor is yours. 
Well, thank you very much for uh, having the opportunity to uh, speak with you all today and for NCSL for putting together this uh, webinar. I think it's uh, I think it's very timely and it fits very well in some of the other work I've been doing um, in the uh, instigating the Wisconsin uh, Legislative Children's Caucus also. Um, newborn screening can obviously save babies' lives and help them begin a healthy life. And when we have effective babies that look, may look perfectly normal at birth, unless newborn screening is done, the condition may stay hidden and cause permanent damage. And so that is, uh, that is the mission of our newborn screening laboratory that's housed at our state laboratory of hygiene as part of the University of Wisconsin uh, Madison campus. Um, we do have, we are screening 46 conditions uh, in our screening panel. Uh, 44 of them are uh, done with the blood sample through the heel stick. Uh, it also includes the hearing loss and the um, heart disease uh, test through the pulse ox. We're also doing a uh, pilot program on Pompeii disease, and we have in the pipeline to add into the uh, our testing is the spinal muscular atrophy, which will raise the total number of um, conditions that are screened for at 46. We also have, as part of our state um, secretary of health services, a process where individuals or groups can nominate conditions to be included in the screening panels for the future. And I'm going to talk about that um, a little bit more uh, uh, in a later slide. What we have here is the sample card that goes to um, all our hospitals, birthing centers, midwives, uh, any place where there, there is a birth, the entire card then is sent to our newborn screening laboratory. Uh, one of the reasons that we are very confident in um, being successful in um, getting most of our babies screened is because this card is sent through uh, whether the baby is tested or not. So we're very confident in the number of um, screenings that are done. We feel we have a 99.4% rate. Now, of course, we uh, just like all the other states, we do have the opt-out um, opportunity for parents who do want to because of religious beliefs or personal convic con con convictions do want to opt out and we do um, uh, we're very specific on making sure that uh, folks are given that opportunity to explain to them what does happen with these uh, particular uh, uh, opportunity for the screening and of course um, as was uh, mentioned before, uh, that typically uh, is covered by insurance plans. In Wisconsin, we are charging uh, $109 for these um, for these screenings, and are very confident that uh, that is um, that is covering those costs. Um, it was mentioned um, uh, by Ms. Cuthbert that uh, we should. Uh, go and ask to be uh, um, take a tour of our local newborn screening labs. And I did take advantage of that uh, just the other day. And we had uh, uh, time to ask questions and, and uh, take a little tour with our director, May Baker, who is on our state and is on the national uh, nomination um, committees also. Uh, Wisconsin started screening back in uh, back in 1965, and the first test that was done was the uh, PKU test. Here again, it says 99.4 percent. What we use in Wisconsin is we contract with one of the uh, statewide ambulance services. So those tests that are hopefully done in the first 24 to 48 hours after birth. Uh, come to our state lab early every morning, and those tests are conducted throughout the day, hopefully with results um, being completed within 72 hours. If there is a positive test, our local um, newborn screening laboratory uh, 
call that uh, primary care physician and make sure that they know what the uh, test result has been even before they have the opportunity to send that out so that there is a uh, so is a, the quickest results available. And as May Baker told me, we don't give up until we get to that particular um, healthcare provider to make sure that there is a there is a high handoff. Our Department of Health Services also provides uh, special helplines, uh, referral lines as part of a maternal and child health hotline for both individuals to get information and for professionals to get referrals uh, to help. So there is uh, definite um, positive information to help uh, new parents understand what is, what is happening and what they can do to make sure that they can um, move forward with the best possible um, opportunities for their children. The advisory committee uh, votes on conditions that are included and uh, they have very specific nine criteria that they uh, take a look at to make determinations whether they should or should not um, add um, tests into the program. Um, our lab is very uh, confident for these uh, couple of tests that they're adding on will actually just be um, not at additional cost to the, to the lab or increase the rate that they're currently asking for because the, uh, uh, the uh, machines themselves are able to be uh, just switched on. As uh, uh, Dr. Baker uh, told us, uh, they're more than capable of adding on these particular, these particular tests. Um, they want to be very mindful of the balance of what is, um, if it is really something that is um, um, highly um, highly positive in uh, something that could be done for these these folks for their infants. Uh, what is the is, is, uh, issue with false positives? How can they move forward in supporting these particular uh, infants if they are detected? And what is the outcome for um, um, early detection versus later detection? So. They're very, uh, very mindful of those nine criteria to make sure that they're making the best possible um, opportunity for youngsters uh, to be treated early. So with that, I think we're going to hand it over uh, back to Margaret. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be part of uh, the webinar today. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Representative Balwig. Uh, we're now going to open up the floor for questions. Um, so if you have a question, please type it into the chat box, which is in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Um, oh, it's on the left-hand side, I'm being told. Uh, so bottom left-hand side of your screen. And if you could just let us know if uh, the question is for a specific speaker or if it's for all speakers. Uh, we do have one question that's already come through the chat box, and this question is for any of the speakers on the line. And the question is, can you briefly talk about some of the reasons why states might not automatically update their newborn screening panel to reflect the RUSP? And any of you can feel free to start and try to answer this question. Uh, this, this is Representative Balwig. So um, I think that goes back to uh, what we heard from uh, Dr. Baker being both part of the national and the state um, um, advisory committees that uh, she told us that we would really want to be more specific to Wisconsin, uh, that it should be a um, uh, more of a um, local uh, experts be part of uh, that discussion. And so that's why they want to look at their specific criteria and what they're going to uh, choose to add to the panel. This is Carla hey, Gufford here. Hi, this is Carla. I'd, I'd just like to respond really quickly. There are a number of reasons why, and I know that there uh, are often questions as to why within why why states don't implement within one year of testing. Um, 
it, it takes time. Everything takes time. So even purchasing equipment, uh, if you know the method that you want to run, that can sometimes take a fair amount of time being able to get that uh, piece of equipment in hand, um, to be able to bring up the test in-house. Uh, can take time for implementation, uh, getting the right people to be trained to be able to do things, getting your IT infrastructure connected uh, so that um, the results are seamless, seamlessly coming off of the instrument and into the IT infrastructure and that sort of thing, being able to ensure that that informa the information connects well. And the, that you have a reporting system available, making sure that everybody who is part of the, the framework gets on board. These things don't happen very quickly. And often what we see that it's that it can take as long as two or three years to actually get this, this actually done. I know that there are a number of other issues why I don't know if Nisha wants to add uh, to this as well. So hi, this is Nisha. So I was going to... Um kind of echo what Dr. Cuthbert was saying um, to answer your question. I mean, there are some states that actually do have an automatic um, addition, so a state like California does, but um, after they had like a stakeholders meeting, they really realized what Dr. Cuthbert was talking about, that to really upstand and to make sure that all the components of the newborn screening program are in place for any disorder added, they added a delay in the, in the regulation and in, in, in the law. So even if um, in California, for instance, even if on the RUSP an addition, a disorder gets added, there's, I believe, an 18 to two year delay. And it's to factor in exactly what we've been talking about, that every component takes a really long time making sure that um, they're robust, they're well resourced, um, and it's ultimately for the newborns to make sure that even if they are found positive in the screening, they are guided to the right um, resources. And so that takes many years, and it does take um, a lot of a lot of stakeholders to come together to come to that conclusion. And so I'm seeing another question from Emily that says, um, you mentioned some states use regional labs or labs outside of the state. Why is this? Does this make it harder for states to add new diseases to the screening panel? Um, so. I did mention this, and it, I know for states with um, a lower birth rate, um, so we noticed most states with less than 40,000 um, births in a given year, um, it, it suits that state to actually um, have a regional lab or a contracted lab. Um, that's what I've gathered. Um, Carly, you're totally willing to take that as well. Yes, it, it doesn't snow, slow anything down. Um, samples uh, are couriered again from uh, from respective states to other locations uh, to be tested at, at, at a specific place. Um, the state itself that is contracting out decides what gets on their panel, and so uh, so they are able to have autonomy in that regard as well. It's a decision that a program makes. It just depends. They take a look at whether or not they do want to um, be responsible for having a laboratory within their state, and that's 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 a decision that they make. We've had states that have contracted out, and then they brought it in-house, and we're happy specifically to work with them as they bring on new tests. Uh, but it, it's it's generally an, um, their own their own decision to make. Great. Thank you all for answering those questions. I don't see any other questions in the chat box at this time, but if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself, Margaret Weil, or Tara Johnson. Um, both of our information is on the screen right now. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our speakers for taking the time to share their expertise with us today. If you have any follow-up questions, like I said, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And this webinar has been recorded and will be made available on the NCSL website next week. Have a wonderful day.